What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are back with Thor. Yes, we are the God of Hammers storyline and we finally get the revelation of who the God of Hammers is and it's really, really cool. So here's the thing. Uh, in the first video, we basically talked about how Thor's hammer over the course of this run uh, that Donny Cates has been writing, that essentially the enchantment, like the worthiness enchantment has basically gone away. So anybody can pick up the hammer of Thor now. And essentially the hammer of Thor had just gone missing and nobody really knew where it went to. But what we also realized is that the Hammer of Thor, whoever was wielding it, had actually attacked the dwarves of Nadavalir and basically obliterated them. Now, what we also find out as we open up with the story is we end up finding out that the Hammer, whoever's wielding it, has basically attacked the other realms, right? The nine realms that are out here. The realm of Muspelheim and like the realms of Jotunheim and all these places have all been attacked by the Hammer. Now, it doesn't mean that there are no survivors. There are people who survive the experience. Experience, perhaps because they weren't there, perhaps because they simply just had the power to do so. We're not really given a definitive answer here. Instead, all we're really told is that they had survived their experience in facing off against the God of Hammers. Now, again, this is a pretty significant thing because these are realms that are full of some pretty powerful people. The rock trolls and like Angela and people like that. I mean, these are formidable foes. And so of course we switch back over to Thor who's basically burying Eitri of the uh, of the dwarves, right? Kind of the forge master, the guy who was the one that built Mjolnir in the first place. And one of the funny things that happens is that as Thor is basically paying homage to Eitri and he's on his knees, of course, saying a bit of a prayer and then offering a burial that falls in line with the dwarven traditions that he's met by Odin who's just like that's enough right like a king cannot rule from his knees boy and Thor in turn is just like I've had enough of this and a, a small little skirmish breaks out between the two of them I wouldn't really call it a true full-on fight I mean it is a cool fight to see and it is cool to see Thor overpowering Odin but it's really one of those hits where it's just like Thor attacking Odin knocking him to the ground and then Thor just lets loose and it's just like this is all your fault right like everything that's happened so far is your fault Donald Blake going insane during the Prey story arc is because you basically created a personality out of nowhere, bonded it to me, and then in turn, I would jump back and forth between the two, but once I returned to my normal self and I stayed Thor, I had no idea this guy was basically trapped in this other dimensional realm with no conceivable way to leave. He was like, this whole hammer, this whole enchantment, the, the thing that you've done here, taking a cosmic entity and binding it to Mjolnir, like, it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. Everything you touch, Odin, every single thing you touch, no matter what it is, it all comes to an end. Everything that you touch leads to ruin and death. You are a walking, talking definition of bad luck. And the thing about this is that Odin acquiesces and Odin's like, yes, like, believe me, I am totally aware of this, right? It's kind of been this guilt that Odin has been carrying around for quite some time that as he was the all father and when he was ruling over Asgard, he was pretty hard on Thor and he was pretty hard on his sons. The idea was to basically mold Thor and also kind of fall in line with like how he had always sort of done things. But at the end of the day, Odin wasn't much of a father to Thor. And so when you have this situation where his son is just letting loose on him, basically spilling all these realities to Odin himself, one of the things that, that Odin has to, has to contend with and has to come to terms with is the fact that this really is all his fault. You cannot take a cosmic entity, bind it to a mortal artifact and believe it'll stay that way forever. Somewhere along the line, something will change. And whether it's because Odin was hubris and he never never really thought he'd have to deal with the consequences of it, or if he had just simply never considered the possibility of it, it all falls on the shoulders of him. But in the midst of this argument between the two, suddenly they're whisked away to, to the realm of the frost giants, right? To the realm of Jotunheim. And that's when Loki reveals all these frost giants have been destroyed by the God of Hammers. And that's when he asks the question, like, have you misplaced anything lately, Thor? And of course, you know, it's a rhetorical question, but as the three of them sit down and as they meet, the whole thing here is that at some previous point in time, Thor said, let there be peace or let there be thunder. And when Loki asked the question, like you're, those are your words, correct? Right? Like you're, you know, at your great coronation when you were officially crowned all father of Asgard. Well, where is your peace now? Right? Like where, where is your thunder? Where is Mjolnir? Where is this hammer? What's going on here? And how could somebody possibly get a hold of your weapon and start laying waste to all the different realms that exist out here? And so that's when he asks, like, who is he? Right? Who is the God of hammers? And the immediate response of Odin is like, this is not nonsense, right? He says, the God of Hammers is a myth, an errant prophecy, the likes of which I have crushed and tossed aside for thousands of years. But in the end, Loki makes a great counter argument here. He says like, but aren't we living myths? Us as Asgardians? We're myths according to the mortal people, right? And we essentially have been 
since like the third celestial host when they told us not to get involved in the affairs of mortal men, right? So like ever since then, we have basically been mythical beings, but we are in effect gods among men. And ultimately where, where Odin says like, this is different. He says, if I were such a God, and of course, you know, Thor ends up cutting him off. But at the end of the day, Loki makes his point here. He says, listen to me, both of you, as we speak, the forces of the 10 realms have taken up arms against you. They believe this assault, no matter the assailant, to be Asgard's doing, to be your doing, Thor. So far, I've been able to keep them from letting loose, but I do not think I can hold them for much longer. So I don't claim to understand what is happening between the two of you, but if I may, get over it. Because no matter what you claim to believe, this prophecy, this myth is real. And Loki goes as far as to say that like, he looked it up, right? He's like, any evidence out there, anything that details the prophecy of the, the God of Hammers has basically been destroyed. And it was destroyed recently. So whoever this, whoever's wielding this God or wielding Mjolnir, right? Whoever this God of Hammers is, destroy the prophecy. There's no real information on this person. All we know is that there was a prophecy somewhere along the line that somebody would come along and they would basically like this God of Hammers would show up on the scene, right? The God of Hammers will rise as it's described. He will ignite the 10 realms and he will take the last king of Asgard and then there will be nothing, nothing but the distant sound of a forge burning, raging as the God of Hammers reshapes the world. And that's when Odin's like, okay, so like we're talking about another war of realms. And that's when Loki's like, no, you misunderstand. The text is literal, right? It's not a, it's not a, a an interpretive thing, right? It's not war. It's not, you know, uh, you know, he will ignite the 10 realms. A fight will ensue between the two, between all these different groups. We've done that dance. We know what a war of realms looks like. That's not what this text means. They will not go to war. The 10 realms will burn. The 10 realms will be destroyed. And so ultimately Odin goes to initially chime in and basically speak to Thor, but that's when Thor's like the Bifrost is coming. Now, here's the important thing to understand. And this is something that's, that's pretty intrinsic here. I'm not a hundred percent sure about this, but I don't believe Thor knows the actual story of Mjolnir. We as the reader do, right? We know that at one point in time, there was a cosmic entity that manifested in the form of a cosmic storm and that Odin had faced off against it. And that Odin had confined that cosmic entity into a piece of Uru metal, which in turn was forged into Mjolnir. But I'm not entirely sure Thor knows the actual story of Mjolnir, right? How all that transpired. And if he does, just by the look of Odin and the way he seems a little desperate in so far as his desire to explain, or at least to tell this thing to Thor, it may be something that we simply just don't know. But whatever the case is, when the Bifrost emerges, it's both Throg, who's basically the leader of Thor's security to a degree, as well as Sif, right? The, the sister of Heimdall, who has essentially replaced Heimdall. And that's when like they send Thor to this particular location. And when he asks the question, like, where are we, right? What realm is this? That's when Thor sees the sign of Broxton, Oklahoma. Now, this is one of those times where when we covered the J. Michael Straczynski run on Thor, we talked about how the events of Broxton, Oklahoma would never really go away. They would always be there, right? That's one of those elements where initially it was a little uncertain if it was going to be important during Straczynski's run, but the more it stuck around going into the events of like Siege on Asgard and things like that, Civil War, the more you realize that essentially Broxton wasn't going anywhere, that Broxton was going to be a mainstay of Thor's mythos for quite some time. For those of you guys who don't know the significance of Broxton, Oklahoma, the idea here is that following the events of Thor disassembled, colloquially known as Thor Ragnarok, when Odin's son had basically died and Asgard was destroyed, that when he returned, he ended up bringing Asgard back. But when he did, he basically took the kingdom of Asgard to Broxton, Oklahoma. And there were some pretty hilarious stories where the townspeople just didn't like them being there and they would like bicker with the townspeople, different things along those lines. But essentially that was the home base of Asgard for quite some time. Eventually Asgard ended up becoming Asgardia uh, following the events of Siege when it was destroyed and rebuilt by Iron Man. And then it basically orbited Saturn for a little while. But the important thing here is Broxton was kind of like Thor's second home to a degree, right? It was the re it was a place where Asgard was essentially reborn. It's, it's a significant place for him. And so when he gets there with Broxton having been destroyed, seemingly whoever this God of Hammers is, is going after everything that is significant to Thor Odin's son himself, as opposed to just arbitrarily attacking things. But in his anger and in his frustration, Thor summons the hammer to himself, believing that it would basically bring the God of Hammers along with him. The problem is that when the hammer comes, the hammer in turn just like crashes directly into Thor. It doesn't simply respond to his grasp where he would just normally catch it. And so ultimately he's like, what in the hell is going on, right? Like how is any of this happening, right? And so ultimately he starts to realize somebody's there and he asks the question, who is that, right? Like who is that that's out there? And that's when this voice basically shows, you know, appears to him and says, Thor, you know my name, you've always known it. And it says, I am the 
God of Hammers. In essence, what, what, it look, what looks to be going on here is the sentient storm, the cosmic entity that was confined within Mjolnir has basically broken free and taken control of Mjolnir itself. So it is a personal manifestation of the hammer. The rightful owner of Mjolnir has finally returned. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. I got to say, I love the God of Hammers storyline. I love pretty much everything that Donnie Cates writes, but I'm really excited to see what happens next. So uh, thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.